Hello everyone. Once I posted a video where I showed the purchases I made at the local flea market. The video is interesting and I recommend watching it. You can find the link in the description. In that video, I showed some very unusual, devilishly powerful power bipolar transistors, TK235-32, 235-32, with a collector current of up to 32A, and power diodes to 135-80, E135-80, at 80A. They came with the appropriate heat sinks. I decided what to do with these components the same day I got home from the flea market. I could have made a laboratory linear power supply of colossal power, but I already have one. But a high power electronic load is a much more in demand device, at least for me. Therefore, it was decided to make an electronic load. Before we start, let me tell you about the main characteristics of the load. The current adjustment range is literally from 0 to 80. A. Briefly, up to 100. In theory, you can draw up to 200A if you replace the current sensors with lower resistance ones. The maximum input voltage is up to 60 V. It can be more. It all depends on the voltage of the transistors. The load is equipped with reverse polarity protection. The maximum dissipated power is 1500 to 1600 W. I haven't tried. More. The device allows you to load almost any power sources, even welding inverters. But it's important not to exceed the maximum power of 1600 W. These are indeed impressive parameters for a linear load. And I should note that all 1500W will go into heating, so it's a very serious heater. At the very beginning, I would like to draw your attention to a few points to avoid additional questions. First, regarding the schematic, it turned out to be quite large, and most likely some small details will not be visible. You can find the schematic in good quality in the project archive. The download link is in the description below the video. Secondly, the values of some components on the schematic may differ from those on the board. It will work either way. Third, in the schematic, I use the most preferable transistors of type 142. These are composite switches that are easy to control in a driver. At the same time, it will be practically cold. However, the total load power with the switches indicated on the schematic will be less than in my case. I use much more advanced transistors. Fourth, the printed circuit board does not have designated spots for power transistors and current sensors. Pay attention to that. BVT1, BVT1, and so on. These points are connected to the bases of the corresponding power transistors. The same goes for the points EVT1, EVT1, and so on. They are connected to the emitters of the corresponding transistors. And finally, the last point. The specified resistor sets the limits of the output current. The lower its resistance, the higher the current needs to be selected. After designing the board, I conducted numerous experiments to understand what power the transistor can dissipate in such a package, what the maximum collector current is, despite the fact that manufacturers specify this value, and how much the control driver will be loaded at different current values on the power transistor. This time, I didn't reach the limit values and didn't burn out a single transistor. Through experimentation, it became clear that the stated 32 the transistor holds. The package can dissipate 150 watts. If there's a fan, then up to 200 watts. Maybe more, but I didn't try. 200 watts from each transistor is not bad at all. In total, I attach four keys to each heatsink. And we have such heatsinks. Two pieces. I forgot to mention the thermal paste. It's present here. The transistor substrate is the collector. The transistors themselves are not isolated from the heat sinks. Therefore, the heat sink is a common collector. In the same way, I attached one 80 amp diode to each heat sink. The reason for them will become clear a little later. Let's move on to the electronic load circuit. In one of the previous videos, I already showed and explained how it works. You can find the link to the video in the description. It's a regular stabilizer, the current on the operational amplifier. Each channel of the operational amplifier controls its own stage, and we have eight such stages. All of them are actually connected in parallel, but the operation of one does not depend on the other. In the emitter circuit of each transistor, a current sensor is connected in the form of two parallel low resistance 5 watt resistors. The resistance of each resistor is from two. 
ohms. The operational amplifier monitors the voltage drop across this resistor and compares it with the reference. Depending on the difference, it increases or decreases the output voltage, which leads to the opening or closing of the driver transistor. Consequently, the same happens with the power transistor. It should be noted that this circuit operates in linear mode, so the transistors are partially open or closed depending on the output voltage of the operational amplifier. The more the power transistor is open, the more current flows in the circuit, and vice versa. All the power is dissipated as heat on the power transistors and sensors. Current. If you are making an electronic load, the first thing to look for is good heat sinks. Let's move on to the board. Turned out quite well. Since we have eight stages, the number of operational amplifiers should be appropriate, so LM324 chips were used. A total of two pieces. Each chip contains four independent op amps, just what is needed. The driver transistor, let's call this part exactly that, in fact, forms an analog of a composite with the power transistor. Such a stage provides a fairly high current gain. The driver significantly unloads the operational amplifier, but naturally, it will heat up, so all transistors were mounted on a heat sink in the form of an aluminum block. By the way, the collectors of the transistors are also common, and there's no need to isolate them from the heat sink. This entire circuit is powered by a linear regulator at 12 volts. The circuit's power consumption is minimal, so there's no need to mount the 7812 regulator on a heat sink. Reference voltage source, the good old TL431. As the most affordable, accessible, and sufficiently accurate reference source. Current adjustment is done by turning the variable resistor. It effectively changes the reference voltage. Since the load is powerful, a second variable resistor with lower resistance was added. The first is for coarse adjustment, the second for finer tuning. The control board requires a low power power source. Since I included a rectifier, AC power can be supplied from any mains transformer with a secondary winding voltage, 12 to 18V. Current, 50 to 100 milliamperes. The board can also be powered by batteries or accumulators. 12V is more than enough. This solution will make the load completely autonomous. A few words about the assembly. The heat sinks of the power transistors are connected using four aluminum bars. They serve as fasteners and are also conductive. The power diodes, which I mentioned at the beginning of the video, are installed at the load input. They are used to build reverse polarity protection. From an efficiency standpoint, this is the worst type of protection, as there will be a voltage drop across the diodes. Volts. Multiply this by the current flowing through, and in the case of our load, the calculated current is 80 to 100 amperes, and we get about 70 watts. Losses, just on the diodes. This leads to significant heating of the latter. To minimize these losses, it is advisable to use Schottky diodes. They have a significantly lower forward voltage drop than regular rectifier diodes. The reverse voltage and current of the diode are selected with the double margin. At the very least, in the future, the protection will be replaced with another one, most likely using field effect transistors. The design uses a multifunctional digital indicator for 300 volts and 100 amperes, with the ability to be powered from an external source. A temperature sensor is included in the set. It is a high precision meter that can display all necessary values. Voltage, current, capacitance, power. You can even set limits for current and voltage. And if they are exceeded, an indication will trigger. Such an indicator is relatively inexpensive, and its functionality is more than sufficient for any purpose. That's basically it. Now let's move on to the test. During the tests, the control board will be powered by a 12 volt battery. It consumes only 10 to 20 milliamperes of current. Let's proceed directly to the power tests. We will be loading this power supply. The highest current one in my collection. This is a 12 volt 83 amp switching power supply. Right now, I'm taking a very big risk because the load is without forced cooling, so over 2 kilograms of aluminum heat sinks will heat up in just a few seconds, so we won't run it for long. The current is adjusted very smoothly. The power that the load is currently dissipating is about 1000 watts. 
It's a full-fledged one kilowatt heater. We turn it off and let the load cool down. Here's one of the unsuccessful takes with testing this load, right during filming at a power of about one kilowatt. The network thermal fuse decided to activate. This happened when I was loading the most powerful of my laboratory power supplies. The maximum voltage applied to the load will primarily depend on the collector voltage, the emitter of the output and pre-output stage as well as the resistance of some resistors in this circuit. In my case, 60 volts is more than enough since I made the load for testing low voltage power sources, specifically powerful computer power supplies. And what about the casing? That's a sore subject. Most of my projects lie around without a casing because I spend much more time creating them than assembling the electronic components. Metalworking and precision are not my forte. And so, another monster was born. It's hard to come up with another name for this beast. Massive heat sinks and power switches. Beastly power. What more do you need for complete happiness? That's all for today. I remind you that all necessary links, including the link to the archive with the printed circuit board, can be found in the description. Well, all that's left for me is to say goodbye. As always, this was Kazian K, with you, until we meet again. Bye.